Okay, let's talk about Jechi, spelled G-Y-E-K-E, -E, but pronounced Jechi, the Akan philosopher, who provides an argument for the concept of a person in the Akan culture. So the Akan culture, right, A-K-A-N, right here, is a culture found in West Africa, um, currently with modern-day borders, a large population of the Akan live in Ghana. But, you know, prior to colonialism, they would have extended throughout West Africa. So the Akan is a particular ethnic group, a very large ethnic group. And Jechi is a well-known philosopher of the Akan. He's a modern philosopher, and so this text is one of the most modern texts that you will have read thus far. You know, people like Plato and Hume and Descartes, these are much older texts. But this is a text that would have been written in the 20, 20, late 20th century, early 21st century. Um, late 20th for Jechi, right? And so in this text, Jechi wants to explain to us and provide an argument for what the Akan conception is of a person. So he's answering this question, the same fundamental question, who am I, right? According to the Akan, who am I? Mm -hmm. What is Jechi's rhetorical style? Right? He has a rather complex rhetorical style, right? Because in part because he's a modern philosopher, but also in large part because he is an African philosopher. And what non-Western philosophers find they must do is they often must engage um, pre-existing stereotypes and understandings and misconceptions about their culture, which are the result of a lot of anthropological uh, texts being written and colonial texts. And so because Africa was colonized by various European powers, there were a number of texts written about African culture, and in this case about Akan culture, by missionaries, by colonial administrators, by anthropologists, by sociologists. And the motivation of many of these writers and their descriptions of the culture was not simply to give an account of the culture. They were actually motivated by other political and economic concerns. So, for example, missionaries were often seeking to document the need for Africans to be missionized, to be Christianized, by showing, you know, problems with their religious belief. Um, similarly, anthropologists were often hired to justify certain colonial enterprises. Right? So what you find with philosophers from certain traditions, like African philosophy and Native American philosophy, is that there is a need on the part of these modern philosophers to take on previous accounts which have represented their culture in ways which is not entirely accurate. So you see that throughout Jechi's text, right? He probably cites more people than any other philosopher that you're going to read this semester. Right? He goes through and he doesn't just take on all previous philosophers, right? So he doesn't just say, talk about Plato or Descartes. But he actually takes on anthropologists, sociologists, and philosophers, and even brings in some discussion of psychology. And so part of his rhetorical style is a type of literary criticism, where he actually reads very widely everything written that relates to this subject, right, the African, the Akan conception of the human being, and he goes through and critiques it, right? So he does this literary criticism. Right, which includes actually a diversity of disciplines, not just philosophical texts. He also does linguistic analysis, where he actually goes through and looks at the way in which linguists have defined particular Akan terms. And so this is a type of philosophy of language, where you look at the meaning of words in order to kind of generate some arguments about meaning within a culture. Right. He also uses a particular argument style, which he identifies on page 93, reduction ad absurdum, which is in, found in your Western book. It's a type of argument where you, um, make an abs you make a claim, and then you show that in order to make that claim, you have to, you have to, um, you kind of, you have to show that the, the conclusion is absurd, right? And so he actually, um, tries to show how some of the claims that he's critiquing um, are absurd, right? Um, and then he presents counter-arguments and finds flaws with them. So throughout the text, he identifies the arguments that other philosophers or anthropologists make, and then he shows you what's wrong with those arguments. Mm -hmm. Now, 
he starts off his entire text by telling you what other people say and then quickly letting us know that he does not agree with them. And so the very first uh, part of the text, right, page 85, under 6.1, he writes, We are given to understand from a number of often quoted, though mistaken, anthropological accounts that the Akan people consider a human being to be constituted of three elements, okra, sensum, and honam. Right? So right away he says, often quoted, though mistaken. Right? So we know right away that he's going to take on this counter-argument. The counter-argument is that the human consists of three elements, right? The okra, the sun, sum, and the hona. And he doesn't exactly agree. Although his critique is not absolute. He's not, he doesn't have an absolute reduction of this claim, but rather he has, you know, a finessing of it, right? So then he goes through, and through his linguistic analysis, defines what these terms mean to the Akan. So he quotes uh, linguistic accounts, anthropological accounts, sociological accounts, and the accounts of other philosophers. Right? And he comes up with this list of definitions. And then he uses these definitions in order to compare these three elements to see to what extent they are distinct elements, to what extent they are the same element, and then what their relationship is to one another. So the okra is defined as the soul, right? It's also defined as the essence of the individual person. Now, all of these are quotes directly from the text, right? This is the language of the philosopher. And in order to be faithful to a philosophical text, we always want to use the language of the philosopher. So faithfulness to the text is important, right? Because if we begin to try to interpret a philosopher's um, thought, and in particular, by changing the terminology, by saying, well, he says soul, but I think he means spirit, um, you're, you're going to get into trouble, because actually philosophers are very particular about the words they employ and how they employ them. They even define their own terms sometimes. And so you always want to use the philosopher's terms when you're evaluating the philosopher, right? So these are all quotes. The essence of an individual person. The innermost self is another way that okra is defined. Transmitter of destiny. Now, he identifies this particular definition, but then he finds fault with it. So I want you to pay attention to this as you read the text. Don't take everything the author says as um, a statement of his claim, of his philosophical claim, right? Because what a number of philosophers do, you've already read some that do this, Hume and Descartes did this in their work, is they present claims that they do not agree with, and then they find fault with them, right? And so he actually identifies transmitter of destiny as one of the definitions that's attributed to okra, but then he ends up disagreeing with it. And it turns out that this is a, this is a, a definition set forth by Riredu, another well-known African philosopher who actually teaches in Florida at the University of Southern Florida, Tampa. Um, and he actually disagrees with him, right? So he would then actually cross this out and say, well, no, this is not a characteristic of the okra. Now, he also talks about it as a spark of the supreme being, identifies the okra as being divine, um, also gives an example of how the okra is always talked about uh, in terms of its absence signifying death and its presence signifying life. So if you do not have an okra, you are dead. Your okra leaves, you are dead. If you are alive, you have an okra. Uh, he also, in one of his um, critiques of Wiredu, ends up defining okra in terms of consciousness. And he distinguishes this from thought, from simple thinking, consciousness. Right? Sunsum is defined as spirit. Right? And he discusses, discusses this at some length. Right? It's also defined in terms of personality right? One's character on page 90. So we talk about certain characteristics, certain traits that a person has that define their character, a person being a person of good character, right? Would, would, would reference their sum sum. Um, according to Jechi, sum sum is a part of the okra. This is one of his claims, right? That the sum sum is actually a part of the okra. This is one of his large subclaims. It actually supports his final major argument regarding exactly what is a person. Um, 
he sees the traits associated with the sun sum as, as psychological as well. So there's reference made to um, certain states, right, which are psychological states, emotional states. Right? Um, Jetchi argues that the sum sum is non physical, but he takes on the arguments of others that it is physical. So this is an important sub argument in his text. He also distinguishes sun sum from okra by saying that sun sum is associated with thought, whereas okra is associated with consciousness. Okay. Uh, like the okra, um, the sun sum survives death, right? The okra survives death, the sun sum survives death, the body does not survive death. Okay. The sensum is a production of thought, and it's also associated with mystical beings and with the ego. Mm -hmm. Now, he also talks about, he has an important discussion about the way in which the sensum is capable of leaving the body during dreaming. And this forms a part of one of his sub-arguments, taking on people who claim that the sensum is physical. He disagrees and says it is not physical and that it's possible for something to leave the body and be non-physical and even possible something to leave the body and to be physically seen or felt in the physical world without it actually being physical itself. Now, in order to believe this, you have to have some acceptance of the existence of the supernatural. So the idea that a ghost, for example, could be seen by a living person without actually itself being a physical entity, right? The whole name is just simply the body, all right, the physical, okay? So, Jechi starts out by presenting the counter-argument that the human consists of three elements. And then he, you know, critiques this position. And he concludes that the human does consist of three parts, but really those three parts are better understood as two parts, right? that it would be better if we understood the honom as physical and the okra and the sunsum as spiritual, kind of two aspects of one part, so that the sunsum is really a part of the okra. And thus what we have, according to Jechi, is a dualistic interactionist self. What does dualistic mean? That means there are two, there's a dualism between two very distinct parts, which we already are familiar with from Descartes the physical and the spiritual, but unlike Descartes, Jechi argues that there is an interaction between the physical and the spiritual, right? So that there is this interactionist relationship between the physical and the spiritual aspects of the self. And we'll talk about that more in his, in his conclusion. But first I want to talk a little bit about um, the way he makes his argument. I want you to pay attention to the critiques that he makes. I'm sorry for that light. Um, right? He makes a number of critiques throughout the text. So he cites a number of other authors, um, and then he takes on some of their claims and shows how they're, they're false. Uh, one is the idea that the okra is equated with destiny. That was Reidu's. Reidu, let me just write his name so you know who we're talking about. Right. That was one of his arguments, W-I-R-E-D-U, that okra is the same as destiny, and Jeshi disagrees with him. Uh, he also takes on the argument that sum sum is material and demonstrates that it's not material, uh, in part by this discussion of dreams. Uh, and then he also takes on the claim by some that the sum sum is the same as the okra, right, that there's an identity between the two. So... Although he does argue that the okra and the sunsum are related and the sunsum is part of it, he does not think they're identical and he argues against that. In particular, on page 97, he takes on the position of one of his students and um, shows what's wrong with that position. Okay. 